Okay, so hello everybody, welcome to the third uh, appeal webinar. And um, this webinar is organized by JT Velikovsky uh, of Newcastle. And so he's going to be the host of this webinar. JT, please. Thank you all for coming and good to see some friendly familiar faces from the evolutionary circuit and this view of life. Let me introduce Dean, Dean Keith Simonton is Distinguished Professor Emeritus at the Department of Psychology, University of California, Davis. Throughout his career, he has pioneered extensive historiometric research on eminent genius level creativity. A great summary of Dean's work is in the book, Scientific Inquiry into Human Potential 2021, from which I'll now partially quote, Dean is the author of 14 books, 155 book chapters in edited volumes, 55 entries in 29 different encyclopedias, has made 350 contributions to 134 different journals, annuals, and other periodicals. His books include Origins of Genius, Darwinian Perspectives on Creativity, Creativity in Science, Chance, Logic, Genius, and Zeitgeist, The Wiley Handbook of Genius, Genius 101, and The Genius Checklist, all of which I'm a fan of. Among his many networks of enterprise, Dean has developed and elaborated his doctoral grandfather, Donald T. Campbell's 1960 Blind Variation and Selective Retention Theory of Creativity into a far more precise and comprehensive framework in his 1997, 2003, 2011, and 2013 papers. So today, Dean will talk to us about creativity as blind variation and selective retention, Campbell's BVSR as philosophy and psychology. Thanks, Dean, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. This, you might say this is a disclosure of possible conflict of interest because uh, Don Campbell is my doctoral grandfather. And um, although it's interesting, I only met him once I, at, at a dinner with uh, his student, Dave Tenney. And even though it was about a two hour, two and a half hour dinner conversation, uh, we never once talked about either DBSR or um, evolutionary epistemology, even though at that time he was writing the chapter for the popular volume on epistemology, but we just, that subject just never came up. Okay, so go to the next one. Click. Okay, creativity is blind variation and selective retention. Click. Campbell's BBSR as philosophy and psychology. Okay, intro. Um, Campbell's blind variation and selective attention and creative thought as another knowledge processes that stimulated controversy for the next half century. Furthermore, this controversy en engaged both philosophers and psychologists, where proponents and opponents represent both disciplines. The positions on the debate cut across disciplinary lines, which I think is interesting. Okay. Hence, here I'll examine BBSR as a philosophical proposition and a psychological hypothesis, arguing that the two are mutually reinforcing. Okay, we'll start off with BBSR as a philosophical proposition. Though published in Psychological Review, the philosophical nature of BBSR was clear. First, Campbell quoted at great length Alexander Bain, Passario, Ernst Mach, and Poincaré, none of whom are psychologists. And second, as implied by the title, Campbell was clearly concerned with epistemology, the knowledge processes. And that turns out to be very important in this talk. Um, indeed, according to one editor of Psychological Review, who I had a conversation with once, this paper could not get published in Psychological Review today. It's not psychological enough. In addition, rather than develop BBSR Psychological Society, Campbell in 1974 chose to elaborate the philosophical aspect into his well-known evolutionary epistemology. 
and an elaboration that had explicit connections with the ideas and conjectures, uh, the ideas of uh, uh, conjectures and reputations of Karl Popper's 1963 philosophy of science, developed at almost the same time. To wit, line variation approximates conceptually Popper's old conjecture. It was this later version of Campbell's theory that had such a big impact on philosophical thinking, both pro, and I list some pros, and con. There's fewer cons than pros. I don't know why, but can I just say something about, uh, some of you may know Charles Darwin said once that uh, whenever he found something that agreed with him, some fact or whatever, agreed with his theory, he knew he didn't have to write it down because he knew he'd remember it. But if it disagreed with his theory, then he knew he had to write it down. And evidently, I am not very good in practicing what Darwin preaches here. Okay. That said, Campbell's 1960 theory was never really adequate logically because one, and never even loosely defined creativity. I mean, it's a fiasco. Two, his definition of blindness was connotative rather than denotative. Later, he tried to remedy the latter by introducing alternative terms such as unjustified, but without appeasing his critics. And I think unjustified is actually a good term, but it didn't stick. Campbell, in fact, missed a, a golden opportunity for if he had provided precise formal definitions, a relation between BDSR and creativity would be shown to be essential rather than hypothetical. Okay, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna analyze BDSR and creativity in terms of problem solving. Problem solving is one of the major forms of creativity, but there's other forms as well, but it just makes it more convenient to focus on one particular aspect of creativity, namely creative problem solving. So we're talking about a potential solution and how creative it may be. So at the onset of a given problem solving episode, let a potential solution be defined by the following three subjective parameters. Subjective means it's inside the creator's head. That's very important. First, we have the initial generation probability P, which ranges between zero and one inclusively, as usual. And an example would be whether or not an incubation period is required. Obviously, P will be lower if incubation is required. Next, we have the final utility, U, which also ranges between zero and one, and maybe a continuous variable, not just a discrete variable. And we can consider this to be like the probability of selection and retention in the final product. Finally, we have the prior knowledge of you, and this is where, we're, where epistemology gets in here, uh, V, which also ranges between zero and one inclusively. And this is sort of like a Bayesian idea of how much you know about the utility in, at the time you generate it. So this could range from like total ignorance to an educated guess to full expertise. And this sort of compares with Plato's idea of justified true belief uh, in a Theotetus dialogue. Okay, the personal creativity of the potential solution is then given by the multiplicative function. Okay, C equals one minus P times U times one minus V. Again, C ranges from zero to one, where one minus P is the idea's subjective originality, and one minus V is the idea's subjective surprise. Okay. That is to be creative is to be original, useful, and surprising, where the multiplicative function ensures that unoriginal, useless, and or obvious ideas cannot be deemed creative. And just to show this is not unique to me, Margaret Bowden argued that creativity needs three criteria, which she called novel, valuable, and surprising. And the US Patent Office uses three criteria, new, useful, and non-obvious, which is just the obverse of surprising. So there's nothing really remarkable here. In contrast, and this is really remarkable, I think, 
In contrast, we can use these parameters to define the sidedness of a potential solution. And this is given by the product of the three parameters, P, U, V, this also ranges between zero and one, and it equals one when P equals U equals V equals one. Okay, that's when the solution is cited. And this represents pure positive expertise. There's also something called negative expertise, which we're not gonna get into. And this means that a potential solution has a high initial probability because it has a high utility, and that high utility is already well known in advance. Using sightedness rather than blindness avoids the unfortunate associations that have accrued to the latter concept. And interestingly, and I noticed that David has, has joined us, this conception of sightedness was actually initially inspired by Ed Sober, who's one of his collaborators, who had a formal definition of what would constitute a directed uh, mutation. And I just kind of elaborated or expanded it to handle multiple variants and explicitly allow for degrees of, of sidedness. And by the way, another one of, of Wilson's collaborators, I also have an association with because I took uh, a social biology uh, graduate seminar from the other Wilson. Anyway, next. It then mathematically follows first. Highly cited ideas cannot be highly creative, as S goes to unity, the minimum creativity stays at zero, but the maximum creativity is also at zero. Second, highly uncited ideas can vary from the highly creative to the highly uncreative. That is, as sideness goes to zero, the minimum creativity stays at zero, but the maximum creativity goes to unity. In words, as sightedness decreases, the range of creativity increases. And I'll illustrate this from a Monte Carlo simulation that I published a few years ago. Uh, here you have uh, the distribution. This is actually, there's 10,000 data points. Uh, don't bother counting them because it gets pretty obscure in the uh, lower left quadrant. But uh, sightedness goes from zero to, well, it should go to one, but because uh, creativity is already at zero, it didn't go that far. Uh, and then you see as sightedness goes down to zero, the variation in creativity increases dramatically. And at the very low side, well, at what we could say blindness area, you have uh, lots of chaff and very little wheat. And so BDSR is required to sift the wheat from the chaff. Okay. Consequently, BDSR has an essential relation with creativity. In particular, it remains the only method capable of a uh, method available capable to distinguish between uh, a the highly creative idea that's P equals zero, U equals one, or approaches one and B approaches zero and a useless but equally original idea with unknown utility. It's, that's, that's, all you, that's the only method you have to distinguish between those two types of solution. In a nutshell, BBSR is used to assess utilities when we don't already know them. We are blind, in quotes, to the actual and precise utility. And just one comment on that, one of the problems with a lot of creativity researchers is they use just the first two criteria and then they can't understand why BBSR might be related to creativity. But if you use four, all three, then it becomes mandatory. Okay. Now I wanna just uh, turn to three brief implications regarding, uh, regarding uh, some very interesting issues. Uh, the first, uh, has to do um, the first next one it is Plato's mental par uh, paradox, one of his major epistemological uh, dialogues, where he argues that inquiry is either unnecessary or impossible because you have to know what you're looking for before you can look for it. That's kind of a very crude summary of what he says. And some people argue it's a specious argument. Plato evidently took it seriously.
The second thing I want to address is the no free lunch theorems of uh, Wolpert and McCready, which has uh, been summarized as all optimization algorithms perform equally well when average uh, over all possible problems. And then the final issue I want to address is DBSR as a mere evolutionary analogy. Uh, here's a quote from James, a remarkable parallel, which I think has never been noticed. And I think James, William James was the first person to uh, pinpoint the parallel. Um, unless somebody can find somebody earlier. Okay, now to the middle problem. Question, how do we know that we know something without knowing it in advance? Answer, we don't. We can only engage in VBSR to test hypotheses or conjectures against a given utility criterion. Okay, indeed, we may even have to use VBSR to identify the best utility criterion. There's some really good examples of that in the career of uh, Thomas Edison, by the way. Uh, next. Uh, or to distinguish solvable from unsolvable problems, because we may undertake a problem that has no solution, like Einstein equations time on his unified field theory. In fact, as prior knowledge increases, as E goes to one, surprise decreases, so less knowledge is gained. So it's the exact opposite of what Plato argued in the Menno Dialogue. Okay, now the no free lunch theorems. Question, how do we know that BBSR provides the optimal procedure for finding the best solution? Answer, we know it doesn't. BBR, BBSR provides the only universal procedure for finding the most creative idea should any maximally creative idea exist. And this is particularly true in complex search spaces where you have a lot of local minima, local maxima. BBSR can e even be used to create an algorithm for optimally solving future problems of a similar type. And Campbell talks about this in his 1960 paper, by the way. Yeah, when that happens, any solution generated by the algorithm will cease to be created because sidedness becomes one and then creativity becomes zero. An example, of course, would be like solving quadratic equations using the quadratic formula. You get no score for creativity doing that. Finally, we have BBSR as a, quote, remarkable parallel, end quote. Question, given all the obvious differences between human creativity and biological evolution, how can the analogy be trusted to yield scientific insights? Answer, BBSR is not contingent upon accepting the descriptive value of conjectured analogy but rather derived directly and logically from the three criterion definition of personal creativity. Obviously, I'm going to hammer that in. Okay. Uh, uh, next. Uh, it's very interesting. Campbell did not explicitly stipulate the analogy in his 1960 paper. In fact, he doesn't even quote uh, Cite Darwin. Um, and it's also interesting that he mentions Bain as proposing a proto-BBSR prior to Darwin, which Darwin overlooked. And I'm gonna say despite Fanny, because this is an interesting little story. Uh, you know, uh, the Darwin archives are phenomenal. They have all sorts of data in there. You can, you can see what Darwin's monthly budget is, was for his dorm room at, at Cambridge, for example. Um, but a family friend named Fanny and we don't know the context of this, but obviously there was some conversation where Fanny said to Darwin, you know, what you're talking about sounds like something that Bain talks about in his most recent book. And um, you should read it. So Darwin dutifully bought the book, re recorded, he kept track of all the books he bought, put it on his library shelf and never read it. We know that because he also kept track of the books he read. But here's a quote from Alexander Bain. It sounds very proto-BBSR. That's the next page. The greatest practical inventions being so much dependent upon chance, the only hope of success is to multiply the chances by multiplying the experiments. That's very BBSR. OK. 
today. All right. And in fact, that's why, because the, the concept is not tied directly to Darwinian evolution, it often really repeatedly re, uh, appears under different terms. So we have trial and error, which is also in vain. We have illumination and verification, which is in Graham Wallace's classic uh, study of creativity. Uh, we have generate and test, which is seen a lot in various artificial intelligence algorithms. And finally, spontaneous behavior, plus selection by consequences uh, in Skinnerian conditioning. Okay. All assume that generated potential solutions must be evaluated to isolate actual solutions. Okay. Okay, now we turn to BBSR as a psychological hypothesis. Uh, although Campbell made a minimal attempt at grounding BBSR and empirical psychological research, subsequent BBSR advocates of psychology attempted to do so. And um, you can tell that most of these people have my surname. So, uh, and, and Damien happens to be one of my star graduate students at one time. Uh, and I just want to mention, uh, uh, let's go back. I have there listed Sal Ting and um, go back previous slide. Uh, Sal Ting and Johnson, uh, just two years ago, decided to completely reframe uh, BBSR uh, and and, uh, and do so using my formalism, but introduced some interesting complexities. Like one of the things they did is they took B and adopting a quasi-Bayesian approach where they split into two parts. Uh, first, the interval estimate of the utility, and then the interval estimate of the utility. And came up with some really interesting implications, but we don't need to go into that. And they did some computer simulations as well. Okay, now the next page. Yet these latter attempts have attracted considerable criticisms as well. And I'll just list all my enemies there, my enemies list. Okay. However, if the previous philosophical analysis has any validity, then the BDSR creativity connection may not be an entirely empirical question. Rather, BDSR creativity relation might be partly comparable to a statement like, all bachelors are unmarried men albeit far more nuanced because blindness and creativity are not equivalent. In particular, although all bachelors are unmarried men is necessarily true in the English language or maybe language or some subtle least of that, I don't know, but at least in English, it's, it's, that's valid. And the statement that all highly creative ideas are highly unsighted is also necessarily true, and there's the math for you, okay? The statement that all highly unsighted ideas are highly creative is necessarily false. And there's, again, the math for you, okay? Indeed, the last statement can be better converted into empirical questions. Like what proportion of highly unsighted ideas are highly creative? And how does that proportion vary across individuals and domains? Nor are the, those the only empirical questions elicited, for you can also ask what cognitive processes and behavioral procedures are most likely to generate ideas where P approaches zero, U approaches one, and B approaches zero. What personal characteristics enable someone to engage in the foregoing, foregoing cognitive processes and behavioral procedures? And what environmental factors affect the person's ability to engage in those processes or procedures? To illustrate, what's the impact positive? Now, and it's just a partial list, you know, general intelligence, cognitive disinhibition, remote association, emergent thinking, behavioral tinkering, mind wandering, introversion, psychoticism or positive specificity, uh, domain specific expertise, multicultural experiences, group composition. 
These are all valid empirical questions. Just as much as discovering what determines whether, when, and who men decide to marry. That's also an empirical question, despite the tautology. Furthermore, beyond nomothetic analyses of BBSR, BBSR can be used as a basis for ideographic case studies of historic acts of creativity, discovery, and invention. For example, uh, using Picasso's Guernica sketches to study creativity. I have two papers on that showing that it's very, very BBSR. Um, and then using Galileo's telescopic observations in the area of discovery, again, very BBSR, like even how he invented the telescope in the first place with BBSR. Um, and then finally, we have invention. I've studied every single one of Edison's patents, very systematic, the distribution and so forth, also BBSR. And of course, that makes it much more concrete than the previous abstract mathematical logical analysis. Hence, the BBSR creativity connection has both philosophical and psychological consistence of significance. The connection is necessarily true, but it requires empirical elaboration. Okay, granddad, final click. There he is. That's grandpa. <laughs> okay. Now, thank you for doing the, the clicking. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you very much for your talk. Jizzy, are you moderating this one? You're welcome to, Natalie. You're better than me at that. Oh, okay. <laughs> so then we, we, we have around uh, five to 10 minutes for, for questions. Um, Please uh, raise your hand uh, um, in the participant box. You can see that and then you can raise your hand and then let me know if you have any questions. In fact, I have a question, a very basic one uh, that I would like to hear your opinion about. Um, Campbell has gotten a lot of criticism about um, uh, the blindness part of the uh, B, uh, blind variation and selective retention, but never about um, the, the, the retention part, which he very much associated with the idea of traditions. And um, um, how, necessarily, how necessary do you think it is for um, creative ideas to become part of a, of a cultural tradition? Dean. Uh, how, how, well, they're, they're obviously gonna be part of a cultural condition because what you basically have is most creators uh, develop in a particular domain of creativity and they sample elements or means, if you want, from that domain. And then they subject those to various kinds of processes and procedures, permutations or whatever, uh, tinkering, whatever it happens to be. And, uh, and that process has to be at least partially blind. Remember, blindness for me is a continuous variable. It's not, a, it's not an either or variable. Um, if they're not partially blind, then they're not creative at all. So there's nothing to select. You know, it's like, it's like cloning in, in biological evolution. There's nothing to select. Um, but in any case, um, at the beginning, you're subjecting cultural elements to the creative process. And that at the end, they're also, of course, being selected by you know, the domain and a larger culture in some, kind, in some situations, like in the arts in particular. And of course that feeds back in so that that becomes part of the domain so that creators, including the original creator, acquires a new sample of means uh, to subject to various um, combinatorial procedures. And then the whole process continues in a cycle. So obviously, for example, for Albert Einstein, once he published a special theory of relativity, then he could use that in his later work, along with other people. In fact, sometimes uh, Einstein got in trouble because he forget his special theory of relativity. He got in a big debate with uh, Niels Bohr, for example, and thought he uh, overthrew qu uh, quantum theory, or at least the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum theory, 
And so uh, Niels Bohr pointed out to Einstein that he, he overlooked the theory of relativity. So uh, it's sometimes hard to assimilate your own ideas. But anyway, so it is a cycle. So you produce combinations, and then once they're accepted by the domain, they enter the domain, and then they become part of new samples and a new creative process, and it just keeps on continuing. Yeah, but there immediately you link creativity with the need for repetition, which in many ways um, uh, annihilates a, 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 a singular creative act as being creative. Uh, by, by the way, I saw that, I, can you say that? I saw that David was trying to raise his hand. So he has a question. Oh, oh. hell, I'll answer yours. I just want you to make I'm sure sorry. you get him in there. Oh, there's yes, a, yes. Please. There's other hands raised too. I'm, I'm finding it difficult to find the I raised hand function, but I guess I'm oh. here, so I might as well. Uh, um, um, uh, Dean, that was so great, and I'm so eager to talk with you at greater length on this, uh, on this topic. Just to keep it short, when you break down a, a evolutionary process into the three components of selection, variation, and, and replication, then it's possible to be very directed with respect to the target of selection, to be very, very precise about that, but then to be more open-ended with respect to the variation around the that's around the target. And so, I mean, that's that acronym, blind variation and selective retention. You know, it could be very unblind with respect to the target of selection and yet quite blind with respect to the variation that's oriented around the target. And I just wondered if that discrimination between the target of selection and the variation oriented around the target is familiar to you or, or, or interesting to you. Well, I mean, that sounds interesting. I mean, there, there are gonna be constraints on, uh, by the way, I should say the way I had conceived this whole um, business now is combinatorial. So I've kind of been kind of regressive here. I do in terms of combinatorial models, uh, like the Monte Carlo uh, simulation, for example. Um, but usually what you have is you have combinations that are, in a sense, pre-selected. You, know, you, you have a domain, and usually you're trying to target solutions of a particular type. And so you're going to leave certain things out. Uh, I mean, a good example of that, just to give a concrete example, is um, what Picasso did. When he was originally given the commission to um, do a painting for the Spanish exhibition, it was actually the Spanish Republic, uh, he originally started off doing um, a painting on the art, artist studio. So he gathered a bunch of ideas that are associated with his artist, artist studio. So you have an easel and you have a bunch of paints and he decided to have on the easel a nude. So, and you know, he did lots of nudes and that all fits what he was gonna do. Uh, and then of course, there was the bombing of Guernica in the Basque country. And he decided he's gonna change the topic. Well, he had a, obviously, since the target had changed, instead of talk, talking about his in a kind of autistic way, his studio, he's gonna be talking about a war atrocity. So he basically reassembled, there's some overlap, but mostly it's a complete reassemble of combinations that would be more suitable for treating a, a war atrocity, including like a menacing bull, uh, a crying woman, uh, a dead soldier. Uh, these are all things where he's, he is um, basically redefining what he's going to be generating the combinations from. And of course, some of the things he ended up throwing out, he had a political statement with an upthrust um, fist, and he decided that was too blatant, so he got rid of that. And that actually became the lamp in the middle, upper middle of the, of the painting. But the point is that you do put constraints on it. Of course, one of the problems is you put too much constraints and you're leaving something out. And that's where I get that, you know, that expression, thinking outside of the box, where you've got to relax some constraint because you're leaving some crucial meme, if you will, out of the combinational hopper. So yeah, I mean, there, there are going to be constraints and um, ahead of time, because you're trying to in most areas, you're trying to target a very specific kind of solution. You're trying to target something like, in the case of Einstein, that's publishable in um, 
a theoretical physics drill, uh, you're, you're not going to be uh, doing pop physics. So that's going to be giving pretty constraints in what you're doing. I hope that answers your question. Sure. <sighs> Okay, I don't see any more questions at the moment, but there are going to be uh, breakout rooms at the end. So if there are more questions, then please stick around and then we can go to the breakout rooms. So let's uh, think, move yeah, forward. I think um, JT has one. JT? Yeah. Well, just real quick, um, Dean, I was wondering, I may have missed it in your presentation, but you also had a paper taking the US patent criteria seriously, which is another reason to add surprising isn't that right? right? That's, that's, I, I use that as part of the argument. Um, I don't try to emphasize that too much because one of the problems is that um, that that is what I call a consensual assessment. You have you have patent examiners who are making that judgment, and I want to emphasize what's happening in the creator's head. It's the creator's own assessment, and of course, what sometimes happens is that. Um, the creator thinks that they come up with a very surprising idea. And then the, the patent office says, you just reinvented the wheel. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I try yeah. to I make that that's a very important distinction to me. And that's why you really talk about selection operating at two level. You have first the ind individual creator making the selective and retention decision. And then then once that idea ends up in a creative product. Then you have the domain and maybe even the society at large making that decision. All right. Thank you. Okay. Let's move to, 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 the, to the next speaker. Uh, JT, you have prepared a pre uh, an introduction, right? So please. Hi, David. Thank you. Let me introduce you. David Sloan Wilson is Distinguished Professor Emeritus of Biological Sciences and Anthropology at Binghamton University, New York, President of Pro Social World, a new nonprofit and spin off of his previous nonprofit, the Evolution Institute, and founder and editor of This View of Life magazine. David is author of 12 books, including Darwin's Cathedral, Evolution for Everyone. The Neighborhood Project, Does Altruism Exist, and Pro-Social with Paul Atkins and Stephen C. Hayes. In 2019, David published the nonfiction book on evolutionary theory and multi-level selection, This View of Life. And in 2020, he also published his first novel, Atlas Hugged, a satire of Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged, integrating the evolutionary worldview. I liked Atlas Hugged so much, I published not one, but two reviews. We also recently published an interview with David, 100 questions on Atlas Hugged. And today, David will talk to us about evolution and Atlas Hugged. Thank you, David. Well, thank you so much. And sorry to be late to my own event. I got time zones uh, uh, mixed up. Uh, 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 Joe, you're wrong. It's 101 questions about <laughs> <laughs> oh, Atlas, uh, Atlas um, hugged, and it's uh, really nice to see some uh, familiar faces uh, here, including Jeff Arndt, my own former PhD uh, uh, a student. So this is a real pleasure, and I love Dean's talk. Nice to uh, see you again, um, Dean, Michael Brady, and so, uh, and then uh, Ed Gibney, and so uh, it's really a nice crowd to have, uh, to have, um, assembled here. And so let's start right in. Um, so who was Ayn Rand? She was uh, born in Russia, uh, experienced the worst of communist uh, collectivism. I've learned that she was actually friends with the sister of Vladimir Nabokov, the novelist. And uh, both of their families had their properties confiscated in communist uh, uh, Russia. So real, she really experienced, you know, had brutal experiences in Russia before immigrating to the US that explains, I think, a lot of her point of view. Uh, she developed a philosophy called objectivism and communicated it through fiction in addition to nonfiction. Uh, she even became a US stamp. Um, here's her own definition of, um, of uh, objectivism, the concept of man as a heroic being. She always used the masculine pronoun. 
with his own happiness as the moral purpose of his life, with productive achievement as his noblest activity, and reason as his only absolute. And she claimed that the premises and conclusions of objectivism were fully validated by science and religion. religion reason. I think uh, objectivism is a version of humanism, which places that same value on um, on individualism and uh, and uh, and reason. Uh, it's very important to stress that uh, uh, Ayn Rand was uh, promoting a moral worldview. She was not licensing selfishness, come what may, uh, but rather that selfishness, properly understood and executed, was best for society as a whole. She wrote, there are no conflicts of interest among rational men. And so uh, she knew little about formal economics, but uh, her, her philosophy was an extended argument for basically the concept of the invisible hand, whereby the pursuit of self-interest is permuted to the common good. And this is why she's an icon, right up there with economists such as Milton Friedman and uh, Friedrich, uh, Friedrich Hayek. Um, and so uh, this speaks to the power of fiction. Uh, she was a philosopher and a novelist, but it was her fiction writing that was by far the most effective at communicating these uh, ideas, selling more than 7 million copies since its publication in 1957, becoming part of the cultural milieu. So even if you've never read Atlas Shrugged or anything else by Ayn Rand, you know the names and you know what they, uh, what they um, stand for. And this really speaks to the power of stories in communicating moral ideas. And I find that a interesting, very interesting subject in its own right. What is it about stories? Why do we think in terms of, of uh, stories? What is the nature, not only of literature, but all of the arts from an evolutionary perspective? And some of you know that there's a literature on that. People like Ellen DeSanayaka, what is art for? And my own former student, Jonathan Gottschall, with his uh, book on the storytelling animal and a number of other um, books. And so in the Q and A, I'd love to talk about the nature of fiction and also turning fiction into fact. What would niche construction be um, but imagining something? What would creativity be but imagining something which does not yet exist and bringing it into existence? And so for a cultural symbolic species such as ourselves, the very distinction between fiction and fact is something that is uh, very, very well worth uh, um, are reflecting upon. So just to tell you the plot of Atlas Hugged, uh, the hero is John Galt. Who is John Galt? A supremely confident inventor who figures out a way to turn static electricity into an inexhaustible source of clean energy. Uh, but he and his kind are living in an America veering towards the kind of socialism that Rand escaped uh, when she emigrated in 1926. And so in the novel, Galt brings about a rebellion of the producers of the world, like the mythical Atlas shrugging the earth from his shoulders so that the looters and the moochers can be brought to their senses. And the centerpiece of the novel is a speech that John Galt delivers to the world by taking over the airways with his technical uh, prowess. Now, why should we care about Ayn Rand? And that's because there's a bigger fish here to fry a bigger beast, as I put it here, of individualism, the in intellectual tradition of individualism, which is basically the claim that all things social can be reduced to the motives and actions of individuals. This is everywhere. It's been the dominant intellectual tradition during the last 70 years. In economics, it appears as the rational actor model. In the social sciences, as methodological individualism, the claim that uh, and as a practical matter, it's best to study all things social at the individual level, regardless of its philosophical underpinnings. And in my field of evolution, it appears as the theory of individual selection and selfish uh, genes. So this is the proverbial water that the fish can't see. Um, Rand gave voice to it, but it would be just as strong as if she never existed. So really what this talk is about is individualism and going beyond it in, uh, 
in all of its um, forms. Well, what preceded individualism? Um, it was the view of society as an organism in its own right, represented by figures such as Emile Durkheim. And so, of course, individuals exist and they play their appointed roles within the societal organism, but the society is at the center of analysis. And uh, this paper, which I've been quoting for a long time by Daniel uh, Wegner, uh, one of the few modern psychologists who started who studied uh, memory as a as a group adaptation in um, in the 1980s, wrote almost every early social theorist we now recognize as a contributor to modern social psychology held a similar view. That's how common it um, it was. So um, so here's what. Here's what preceded individualism in my field of evolutionary uh, biology. Um, so at first, Darwin thought that competition among individuals, individual level selection, could explain all examples of design that had been attributed to a, a creator. But gradually, and it was gradual, we, can, we know that because we can trace it in uh, successive editions of his books, he realized that any behavior oriented towards the welfare of others or one's group as a whole, because social is the single word for that, was an exception. Why? Because pro-social behaviors place individuals at a relative disadvantage compared to more self-serving individuals within the same group. And so there was a glare gaping hole in his theory of natural selection, and he could fill it by adding another layer of competition between groups in a multi-group population, in addition to the selection among individuals within groups. And when I try to convey this to an audience, I like to use the game of monopoly. You know how it goes. The object is very much it's a competition among players. And the object is to capture all the real estate, drive everyone else bankrupt. So imagine that you're playing the single game of monopoly. And now, Imagine playing a Monopoly tournament in which the trophy goes to the team that collectively develops their property the fastest. And I do believe that if you imagine playing this game, you'll see that nearly every decision you make as a team player will be different than playing the regular game of Monopoly. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting. What it takes to function as a team is completely different than what it takes to beat other members of your own uh, team. And we unlock the team part by adding another layer of competition. Isn't it interesting that we're capable of doing both, depending upon the context? We, we can play the single game of Monopoly with relish, or we can play the Monopoly tournament with equal uh, relish. I've actually done this in a high school science class, and it was so fascinating to see the transition from the single game to the Monopoly tournament. Also note that there's no context for cooperation among teams in a Monopoly tournament. Uh, for that, we would need to add yet another layer of competition uh, involving uh, teams of uh, teams. And uh, that is the most intuitive way I know to introduce multi-level selection theory. Natural selection within groups is like the single game of monopoly, and it results in disruptive self-seeking behaviors, the opposite of pro-social behaviors. Natural selection between groups is like the monopoly tournament. It results in highly pro-social behaviors expressed within groups. So teamwork does not come for free, and it requires a process of selection at the team level and is opposed by selection among individuals within teams. All of this was perceived by Darwin way back uh, when. And we can stretch it out, as I've already hinted, um, to a multi-tier hierarchy. Going downward, we can think about competition among genes and cells within single organisms. Uh, we have organisms within groups, and we have groups within groups within groups, both in biological systems and in human social systems. The general rule is 
adaptation at any given level requires a process of selection at that level and tends to be undermined by selection at lower levels. That is the iron law of multi-level uh, selection. And um, this book by Athena Actipus at Arizona State University goes down in scale and, uh, and uh, discusses cancer as a process of selection among cells within multicellular um, organisms. Cancer cells are perversely adaptive. Um, uh, selection is all about differentials. A cell that proliferates faster than other cells within our body is adaptive in that sense of the word. Evolution has no foresight. The fact that the cancer cells are going to bring about their own destruction is beside the point. Um, so, um, um, and cancer biologists talk about, uh, such as Athena, talk about cancer as cancer cells as cheating using the lexicon of human social um, interactions. And by the same token, we can take cheating strategies, um, various strategies which are succeeding at one level, such as, for example, nations growing their economies, but disruptive at a higher level, such as overheating the earth as cancerous, uh, why not? And so, um, um, and uh, as a final point, this perspective is new in the cancer research community. How is it possible for cancer research to be so uh, huge and yet at the same point miss this kind of insights? It's because it's so mechanistic that if you're familiar with uh, Nico Tinbergen's four questions, uh, the four different questions that must be asked for any product of evolution, function, history, mechanism, and, and development, then most cancer research is, is basically mechanistic in tone. It's not fully rounded. And when you take a fully rounded approach to, to cancer, it is just so very interesting. And this is the book to, uh, to read on that uh, on that. Uh, 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 topic. So in human terms, what's good for me can be bad for my family, all the way up to what's good for my nation can be bad for my planet. And I think you can see how profoundly different this is from the invisible hand concept, which pretends that the lower level pursuit of self-interest robustly benefits the, uh, the uh, uh, common good. This is paradigmatically uh, uh, different. Uh, so I was able to explain multi-level selection to you uh, quite easily, uh, not hard. And so why was it rejected? I mean, there's a real puzzle there. And uh, some of the people in this uh, audience are old enough, like me, so that they were actually present during the 1960s and, and 70s. And they, they will remember the zeal with which uh, uh, group selection was... Uh, um, are rejected. And uh, I find it very helpful to think that the reason for that zeal was because this was part of the, basically the dominance of individualism across the, across the uh, board. Um, my evolutionary colleagues were just exulting over how their theory was converging with economic theory, uh, for example, as if some great generality had been achieved when in fact it was just a convergence on this narrow point of view of individualism. And so there were two aspects to the rejection of, of group selection. One was accepting its logic, but then claiming that uh, within group selection, lower level selection is invariably stronger than higher level selection, uh, in which case there simply is no prosociality in nature. Uh, as G.C. Williams said, mother nature is a wicked old witch. Uh, but in other respects, um, it was a repackaging of pro-social behaviors to fit a narrative of self-interest. And so helping kin became helping my genes and the bodies of my kin. A reciprocal relations became scratching your back so that you'll scratch mine. Um, um, everything that evolves is apparently due to selfish genes, but somehow it results in individuals and even groups as vehicles of selection. And so these forms of individualism ended up more or less giving back with one hand um, what was taken away uh, from the other. And this has led to a position called equivalence. Um, the uh, basically theories that, uh, 
that uh, don't and do not invoke different causal processes merely offer different perspectives on the same uh, process, different accounting methods, you might you might say, and therefore deserve to coexist. It's a it's a kind of a pluralism which deserves to coexist. And so there's an interesting philosophical literature on that uh, on that topic that we can uh, uh, that we can uh, talk about. But at the end of the day, what we have to reach a consensus on is that there is some stubborn truths that all theories of social evolution must acknowledge. Why? Because they're simply facts of life. It is simply a fact that social interactions take place in groups that are small compared to the total population, that pro-social behaviors are selectively disadvantaged with disadvantageous within those groups, and that a process of differential fitness among groups must take place for pro-social behaviors to evolve. Look at evolutionary game theory, look at inclusive fitness theory, look at selfish gene theory. You will find all of those ingredients. And so uh, there's a lot more unity to theories of social evolution than meets the eye. Well, while all of this was taking place in the 1970s, another renegade biologist, Lynn Margulis, made her rad radical proposal that nucleated cells, which are much more complex than bacterial cells, um, did not evolve by small mutational steps from bacterial cells but instead as symbiotic communities of bacteria that became so cooperative that the group became a super organism. And this is a game changer for individualism. Recall that the tradition of individualism seemed to replace the previous tradition of treating society as an organism in its own right. But if individuals are themselves societies of organisms, then what's wrong with considering their own societies as organisms? at least when certain conditions are met. The very concepts of organism and society have merged. This is truly paradigmatic. And then in the 1990s, which wasn't so long ago, uh, Maynard Smith, John Maynard Smith and Ernst Swarthmore generalized this concept through a major evolutionary transition, so, which is very much a matter of multi-level selection. Basically, it notes that the balance between levels of selection is not static, but can itself evolve. Uh, mechanisms evolve that suppress within group selection, causing between group selection to be the main evolutionary force. And when this happens, the groups become so functionally integrated that it becomes a higher level organism in its own right. And everything that we currently recognize as an organism is in fact a highly regulated social group of lower level entities that evolve by group level uh, selection. And then it made sense of human evolution as a major evolutionary transition. There's a night and day difference between chimp societies and small scale human societies, even though we share 99% of our genes. In chimp society, naked aggression is over a hundred times more frequent than chimp com in chimp communities. And this is because in humans, we have strong social control mechanisms which suppress bullying and other forms of disruptive self-serving behaviors. Here's two great books on that topic. And I think that it's very interesting and important to, to, to remember that human moral systems include two, two dimensions. There's a compulsory dimension. We have norms of behavior. And if you don't abide by them, there's consequences, you must. And at the same time, there is the voluntary dimension that makes us genuinely other oriented, genuinely pro-social. And the reason that these must go together is that the compulsory dimension makes the social environment safe for the voluntary dimension to be expressed. You must have the compulsory dimension in order for pro-sociality to basically win the Darwinian contest. It only does so in a protective social environment provided by the compulsory uh, 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 dimension. And so this major evolutionary transition then led to cooperation in myriad forms, both physical and mental. Uh, the mental form included the capacity for symbolic thought. This became an inherent system in its own right. And so we have dual inheritance theory, two streams of inheritance in our theory, 
co-evolving with each other. I'm going as fast as I can to leave uh, room for uh, Q and A, and I'll be done in just a minute or minute or um, uh, two. And so we just had the most wonderful genre of books. Uh, this expansion of evolutionary thinking to include all things human. Uh, Joe Henrik's two books are just amazing to uh, read. All of uh, all of human history becomes a fossil record of multi-level cultural evolution. Here's two of Peter Turchin's book, including an analysis of American history, which is the, probably the most important book for you to read to diagnose our current, um, our current uh, uh, times. And economics, here's uh, three books, and the social uh, uh, sciences. And so it's against that background that we can return to the power of fiction and why I wrote a sequel to um, Ayn Rand's novel. It actually took place at a workshop on economics that I had organized. And a person, it was actually Nick Hanauer, who is a progressive zillionaire in um, the Seattle era, one of the first investors in uh, Amazon.com, but he's very progressive in his thinking. In fact, he's been one of the most influential people behind the $15 an hour minimum uh, wage. He just observed idly that since Iron Man was so successful communicating her individualism through her fiction, shouldn't someone be doing the same for our worldview? Uh, my dad's a novelist, by the way, Sloan Wilson, and so this struck a chord in me. And so, uh, yeah, I thought, let's do this. So the hero of Atlas Hugged is John Galt III, the grandson of John Galt I. Ayn Rand was not a character in her own novel, but I put her into mine in the form of Ayn Rand. And um, John Galt's father, John Galt II, is a libertarian media giant like Rush Limbaugh. And like Luke Skywalker battling Darth Vader in Star Wars, John III rebels against the evil empire of his father by challenging him to a duel of speeches. And if that sounds a little, little bit corny, no less a discerning person than Joe V gives it his endorsement. Okay, so uh, fiction and nonfiction, take your piece. I think it's fascinating to me that um, uh, these books actually really did co-evolve with each other. Uh, I wrote the novel over a period of seven years as I was working on economics from an evolutionary perspective. And while Rand's claim that um, her objectivism can be fully justified by uh, uh, science was false. I think that's something that's arguably true for the objectivism portrayed in, um, in my book and shuttling back and forth between fiction and fact um, can be done, I think, uh, more than any novel I, I know actually. And so uh, it's an exciting occasion for discussing. And uh, I've had many conversations with, uh, with um, people on the, uh, including Joe and Ed actually, who's on this, uh, on this call. So uh, lots of things to, uh, uh, to uh, discuss. And then uh, I hope I left some, some time for Q and A. Thank you very much, David. Um, questions? Please your, raise your hand or if you don't know how, then uh, put it in the comment box. Uh, João, João Pinheiro. Hi, hi everyone, and thank you for the talk. Looking thank forward you. to reading the book. Um, I'm afraid you might have already hinted at uh, an answer to this question in some way, but um, can't rational action theory, rational action theory, um, simply put away this problem by accepting, for instance, that other regarding preferences may have evolved. And I think we get these kind of explanations quite easily with repeated or evolutionary game theory, for instance, where these preferences uh, can be, uh, which are other regarding preferences, may have a selfish justification. Uh, and so far as, for instance, uh, a purely cooperative group may retain average higher fitness than a pu purely defective group. So it is rationally, uh, it's, in, it's on, in our rational self-interest to behave cooperatively. Yeah. Well, um, so let's spend just a minute on this and, and I want to leave, keep the answers short, the questions and answers short so that we can get 
a bunch of them. So as you know, with evolutionary game theory, it's called n-person game theory, which means that the social interactions take place in groups of size n. n is often two, but it can be larger. And if you they take those groups and you look inside them, you find that the cooperators are never advantageous within those groups. Even tit for tat never beats its partner within groups. It only ties or loses. Um, and so, uh, and the only way that you could call a, a cooperative strategy in game theory um, um, rational is not by that within group comparison. It's irrational by the within group comparison. It's only rational averaged across groups. Uh, you have to have basically a population of groups. They have to vary. Typically the variation is random. So the rationality is basically is an averaging approach. It's an averaging algorithm to see which strategy, the cooperative strategy or the, or the, uh, or the uh, selfish strategy is more fit all things considered. And so, um, and so it's at that point that um, a cooperative strategy appears, appears uh, rational. So game theory isn't wrong but it just includes the logic of multi-level selection theory and must. So this is actually a good illustration of, of equivalence, basically, how something which seems to be individualistic seems to be, um, seems to be an alternative to group selection actually includes multi-level selection, all of those um, um, uh, uh, truths that I, I listed within, their own, within, its, own, within its own structure. Are there more questions? You can raise your hand or you can say it in the chat box or just chip in. Paula. There is also going to be uh, breakout rooms later so we can also talk later. Paula, you had a question? Oh, you gotta unmute, here we go. Ask you, thank you for, for the talk, very interesting talk. Uh, I would ask you to expand uh, your proposal to language evolution. You, you mentioned very quickly Deacon's book. Um, do you think that um, actually in the earliest phases of language evolution, actually you have to have uh, mechanisms based on um, selection at the gene level uh, and only later on in language evolution when you have uh, more sophist sophisticated kinds of language you need group selection to explain these uh, later phases of language evolution. So uh, what, what do you think about that? Well, the, uh, this is a really fascinating question. Uh, thank you uh, for it. And I think that there is a paradigmatic change between the idea that language is kind of first and foremost a genetic adaptation, um, that there's a universal grammar, for example, the kind of approach to language associated with Noam Chomsky and Steve Pinker, uh, to uh, another approach. Uh, and Daniel Dorr, an uh, Israeli cognitive scientist, has written a book on this. And it's, uh, actually, there's articles on it in this view of life that I can link to. And, but he's not the only one that's treating language as, as much more of a cultural invention from the get-go. I mean, first of all, you're starting out with a chimpanzee-like ancestor who is super smart, and, but not very cooperative. And just imagine in a group that's so um, exploitative that, you know, you, you, there's just, you don't trust anyone, okay? And then make that group more trustworthy. So now, now that there's a need to cooperate. And it's at that point that very, very smart primates invent for themselves uh, a way to communicate. It might have started out gestural, but it would be it would be cultural. It would be like technology, it would be like the internet, the way we constructed the internet. Um, uh, and of course, it's constructed around our own abilities. And so one implication of that is, is that there's not a universal grammar, that this actually happened independently in different geographical regions. And as with all forms of con uh, convergent uh, evolution, 
um, they became functionally roughly equivalent. They all have to serve as communication vehicles, but they don't have to, they don't have to be similar in any other way. Their, their grammars can be very, very different. So no universal grammar, isn't that an interesting possibility? And so I think in general terms, what there's been a bias towards interpreting humanity as basically a universal genetically evolved human nature. Certainly the field of evolutionary psychology is predicated upon that. But more and more we're seeing that cultural evolution runs deeper than, uh, than we thought. And there's many streams of thought. Joe Hendricks book on weird societies. Uh, I think it's Celia Hayes on cultural gadgets. No, it's not Celia, cultural gadgets. Um, uh, so much of what we're thinking, we assume must be, must be genetic is turning out to be cultural. And of course it's co-evolutionary. And the idea that uh, the idea that basically culture is the fast force, and so along with learning, and so in some ways genetic evolution is just kind of following where we're learning first learning and then and then multi generational cultural evolution leads. So then um, this is all part of what's happening. More questions, um, Ed Ed okay. Gibney. Yeah, hi, David. I, um, hey. we, we hosted our um, humanist book club meeting uh, of Atlas Hugged uh, this week, and uh, it, it went over quite well um, with, with some, but some strong reservations as well that, that I was hoping you could maybe address. Um, uh, the, the biggest one probably was this fear of what, how tight you have to be to have this kind of whole earth ethic that, that you're talking about um, in the book. Um, I don't want to give away spoilers in the book about, about how that, that, that's portrayed, but you know, sort of given the, um, the epistemic blindness we have about our future past, just how, how tight could a, a whole earth ethic really be? So when you talk about like, you know, maybe the next major evolutionary transition for, for human culture to come together, um, just how, how, how would that look, do you think? Well, that's, uh, thank you for that, Ed. And, and um, it enables me to tie things back to Dean's talk. Um, uh, I also want to make a point about fiction and, and, and the power of stories, because when you think of stories as basically one of the prime vehicles for conveying a moral worldview, then it helps you to appreciate why uh, some paradoxes, uh, for example, um, if a story resonates with your moral worldview, you'll embrace that story, even if it's not a very well-told story. And by most accounts, Ayn Rand's story, Atlas Shrugged, is a terrible novel. If you look at, um, if you look at um, um, uh, B.F. Skinner's Walden Two, it stinks as a novel. But nevertheless, they're influential books. Why is that? It's because when you resonate to the worldview, you forgive flaws in the story. Mark Twain called the Book of Mormon chloroform in print. That's how poorly written it was. But, um, but nevertheless, it's a powerful sacred, um, uh, uh, sacred text. And, and for the same reason, if, uh, if, a, if a story does not convey your worldview, in fact, if it conflicts with your worldview, you'll reject that story no matter how well it is told. And so it's for that reason that no work of fiction is universally loved, okay? Now against that background, um, you could ask, you know, who's likely to enjoy Atlas Hugged or not? And, um, and so people that already have a whole earth ethic, they love it, they gobble it up. Um, uh, Ayn Rand fans, and it has come to the attention of the Ayn Rand Institute. Well, guess what, they hate it. Um, now what about the average humanist? And I mean, as you know, Ed, I have a kind of a love-hate relationship with, with uh, uh, humanists, but one of the things I think that's problematic about humanism is it's very, very individualistic. It might not be of the Ayn Rand variety, but it's very much the heroic, rational thinker. And I have proof of that, Ed knows, because I have, I've done a little study of, of um, I won't go into that because there's not, uh, uh, there's not time. And so it's against that background that my prediction is, is that when a humanist group reads Atlas Hugged, there will be mixed feelings about it. 
uh, regardless of how well the story is told, but for just the reason that you stated. So your question was, um, you know, how precise do we have to be about this whole earth ethic? How, how, was it really the case that we have to plan our actions with the welfare of the whole earth in mind? And, uh, and if so, with what kind of precision? Isn't that kind of constraining? Um, and the stack of symbols on the, on the uh, cover of Atlas Hug with the earth on top, then the a flag, American flag below that, then a circle, then a dot, represents basically multi-level selection. That we do need to have the welfare of the whole earth in mind. That's the highest good, Gaia, the highest good. But also it's for the benefit of individuals, that's the dot, and individuals must form into groups. That's extremely important, the importance of the small groups. And then they must work through intermediate layers represented by the flag. That's the multi-level. And as to how precise it must all be, one answer to that question is very, very precise. And if you look, for example, at, at, at the technical problem of, for example, global or climate change, what do we need to do in order to ameliorate climate change. Well, we know that's precise. Who would say that it isn't? I mean, and obviously there's a need for experimentation, of course, and creativity. Absolutely. But we need to be very precise about monitoring it and doing something about it. And then, of course, experimenting around that. And I would think, and then, of course, it has to be translated to lower levels. And Kate Rayworth's donut economics is something that some of you know about, does that beautifully. It's a planetary, basically, um, um, scope of, of what we need to do, both with respect to planetary boundaries and social boundaries. And then how do we do it? Well, there has to be a donut city. Amsterdam is becoming the donut city. There must be, within Amsterdam, there needs to be donut neighborhoods. But in each and every case, there needs to be some guidance for what we can do at our level that can contribute to the common good. And there has to be a lot of technology and precision in that. So I think that's the answer. And, and, and I'd be interested, you know, I'm guessing that'll really resonate to some people, but will not with others. And there'll be a lot of misgivings, but, but it's the conversation that needs to take place. I think Michael also has a question. Michael Brady, the last question. Yeah. Uh, hi, David. Um, hey, Michael. We're actually, uh, I'm teaching a joint uh, seminar with a guy in biology. We're using your book. Wonderful. And we're, we're almost finished, the uh, This View of Life book. Wonderful. And we're almost finished. And one question that's arisen that has to do with your uh, point about um, the need for um, selection at higher levels in order to unify organizations at lower levels. And so we haven't got to the last two chapters yet, that's next session, but when you get to a planet-wide system of uh, coordinating not only individuals, but groups of individuals at a planet-wide level, uh, how, how is selection at the planet-wide level supposed to work when there's only one planet? <laughs> Right, they'll, they'll never be between planet selection, but what there can be is between policy selection. And so basically we're selecting different worlds um, uh, in terms of our policy choices. And a lot of this is about, um, is about um, uh, individuals acting as agents of group level selection. This is true not only at the planetary level, but at any, uh, any level. Individuals have to be consciously acting as agents of group level um, uh, selection. And it ties way back to pragmatism, okay, back to Dean, and so that there's, you know, uh, you know, good scholarship in this in this room on this uh, on this topic. It's very much the way that William James uh, thought uh, the, all the pragmatists, John Dewey and 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 so on, is that there's multiple universes out there. Um, in our imaginations, and then we're the ones that bring them into being. I just did a um, an amazing print conversation with a, a Greek classic scholar and political scientist named Josiah Ober at Stanford University on the rise and fall of classical Greece as a cultural major evolutionary 
transition, I recommend that to everyone just go on to this view of life and search for the um, one of the top articles on on Greece democracy. In the first place, uh, I mean, Greece was just a, the perfect venue for cultural multi-level selection. There were over a thousand city-states, all connected to each other by by trade and by sea routes, and 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 the emergence of of democratic governance was an amazingly explicit process, an amazingly explicit process. These were people that were just explicitly thinking about about democratic governance, about federalism. They added, they they created the layers. They created the institutions, the compulsory bonds on the elites. It was a it was a conscious effort to an extraordinary degree. And of course, plant chance played a huge role as to how it all worked out, but it was guided intentionally to an amazing degree. And I think that there's many other examples of that. So the whole concept is, is that what we must do is we must act as, as the agents of higher level cultural evolution. And then once we get comfortable with that concept, then applying it to the whole earth ethic, whole earth level is just the next step. But there's nothing, there's nothing conceptually different about acting as, as agents of, of, uh, of higher level selection. Thank you very much, David. Gustavo, I see that you also have a question, but we have to move on to the next speaker. But um, after the next speaker, we also have breakout rooms. And so then uh, we can continue this discussion. And I really hope that you can save your question for then. I hope that that is okay. Okay, so now moving on to the last uh, speaker of our session, that is JT Velikovsky. And um, so JT uh, contacted me I think already over five years ago when he was doing his uh, PhD at the Newcastle School of Creativity. And I instantly knew that he was a, a very smart guy. He has encyclopedic knowledge on many, many, many things. And uh, so he has a background in movie creativity. Uh, he has uh, done some screenwriting. He has a very interesting history. I think he calls himself most of all an information scientist. And so he's very creative, uh, a very nice guy. And I'm also very happy and very grateful for the, the, the meeting that he has been uh, arranging today. Everything that uh, we see here today is, is through his work. And so he has prepared a video for us and I'm going to um, share my screen on that. Hi, I'm JT Velikovsky. I'm an error prone cybernetic organism. Thank you for the honor of speaking at Appeal today. And what's with the sunglasses? I have intraocular lens implants, so a bit sensitive to bright lights. And today I'd like to talk about my forthcoming book, PC of E3, no, P3 of EC. I always get that wrong. So the full title is Principles, Protocols and Practices of Evolutionary Culturology. And you can probably see why I call it P3 of EC for short. And it comes out in November. And there's the website. So in this talk, I'll cover my brief bio, my past five chapters on Evcult, an outline of the book, and some questions for you. I'm never sure if I'm a systems, information, communication, computer, or creativity scientist. So I just call myself evolutionary culturologist, doing the science of evolutionary culturology. So I have a Bachelor of Arts in Communication, a certificate in screenwriting and media production, then I worked in the creative industries for about 15 years and I was the national video game market analyst for Australia in 2000 and my first academic paper was published in the discipline of computer science in 2005 and I have a PhD in film creativity and cultural evolution and I'm a member of the CES 
So I came up through the Newcastle School of Creativity. So I'm a reviewer for this journal and associate editor of this journal. And there's more on my background on the Appeal YouTube page. And so in the appendix of my PhD, I republished a chapter from this book, Creative Technologies for Multidisciplinary Applications. And it was a chapter called The Whole On Part On Theory of the Unit of Culture or the meme and narim in science, media, entertainment, and the arts. And so that chapter was republished in the Encyclopedia of Information Science and Technology. And the following year, it was republished in Technology Adoption and Social Issues. And the year after that, in advanced technologies and methodologies in AI. And then last year in the Encyclopedia of Creativity. And so at my publisher's request, I'm expanding that chapter out to full book length. And so this is the brief for the protocol series. They serve as a guide to current best practices, lab methods, policies, and protocols. So they serve as a guide or handbook or manual and aimed at scientists, lab technicians, professionals, practitioners, students. Here's three books I really like for the systems worldview. Laszlo's Introduction to Systems Philosophy, Capra and Louise's The Systems View of Life, and Csikszentmihalyi's The Systems Model of Creativity. I also have some posts on my PhD blog, Storiality, about systems science, if you like that kind of thing. And so here's the eight parts of the book to give an idea of what's in it. And so like me, you're probably wondering what is evolutionary culturology? Well, what it is is best answered by where it is. It's up there. It sits atop this consilience column or science stack. So let's just zoom in for a closer look. So evolutionary culturology sits on top of evolutionary anthropology, on top of evolutionary sociology, evolutionary psychology, evolutionary biology, evolutionary chemistry, physics, geology, astronomy, mathematics, and evolutionary systems philosophy. And this whole on part on fractal model of culture has recently been cited in evolutionary economics. In these two books, and economics is one of those things that applies to almost everything as well. Because money can't buy everything. And so what are the nested domains of knowledge of Ev Cult? Well, I've been very influenced by these two books, Consilience by Ed Wilson and Convergence by Peter Watson. And so the larger set is consilience or convergence and then within that system science within that evolution because evolution occurs within systems or ecosystems 
within that applied evolutionary epistemology and within that ev cult and so here's how sir karl popper says science proceeds he might even be right he suggests it starts with a problem then we have the creation of tentative theories then attempts at error elimination and that leads us to new problems and so here's three scientific problems that the whole on part on fractal model of culture may apply to so the aims of applied evolutionary epistemology or the problem to identify the various units, levels, and mechanisms of biological and socio-cultural evolution and how they together explain evolution at all ranks of life. There's a great quote from Natalie. Another one. We need a theory that can identify the unit of functional organization and therefore the center of analysis on a case-by-case -case basis a great quote by David from Atlas Hugged talking about multi-level selection and another one Donald Campbell maintained creativity involves the following three conditions variations selection and retention another great quote from dean's book origins of genius and i highly recommend dean's lecture from the 2019 metascience symposium on scientific creativity discovery and invention as combinatorial so here's one potential solution to those problems or questions. The three laws of holon partons as a tool or instrument or even magnifying glass for identifying the units and levels of culture. And biology. So here's the three laws. Look for units that integrate upwards into a larger unit on the level above. Compete, cooperate, and do co-opetition sideways with units on the same scale level. And command and control smaller units on the level below, which are inside them or a part of them. So what even is a holon parton? Well, it's a unit that is simultaneously a whole and a part. So there's a model. If you look at the medium sized unit there, it's simultaneously a whole, but also a part of the larger unit or holon parton. And so systems are holon partons because they contain subsystems, which contain subsystems. And so units of culture are structured as fractal whole on partons using the three laws. And so why that name? Well, I combined two old things to get a new thing. Kusla came up with the concept of a whole on from the life sciences and culture. Up there and Richard Feynman identified partons in the domain of quantum physics and like Dean says it's good to combine units from disparate domains of knowledge so culture in the life sciences and quantum physics so combinatorial creativity it's science meets the arts so it's consilient and so that's why the name whole on part on so that's your three laws for identifying units and levels of culture 
and biology. So you can use the three laws as a tool to examine the units and levels. For example, we could look at a family as a unit, maybe mum, dad, a kid and a dog, and they integrate upwards into their local community. They compete and cooperate sideways with other families and individuals on the same level, and the family unit controls and commands units on the level below, mum, dad, kid and dog. And we can move this tool up or down the holarchy, partarchy, and locate the units and levels of multi-level selection. So I really like the cover of David's book, Atlas Hugged, with the symbol on the front cover. So you have multi-level selection with an individual or person or organism and you have a group and you have a nation or country and the whole planet and multi-level selection because of Malthusian population pressure and limited resources so gotta love multi-level selection So we can use the three laws to analyze domains of culture, such as written words or language. So you have the whole on part on structure and the three laws, integrate upwards, compete and cooperate sideways, control and command downwards. So for example, starting with an alphabetical letter, that's a unit and level of culture that integrates upwards into a morpheme which is part of a word that integrates upwards into a word integrates upwards into a phrase integrates upwards into a clause integrates upwards into a sentence and that all integrates upwards into a discourse whether it be a poem a book a song a joke what have you so the three laws a handy little tool for analyzing units and levels of culture. And it would seem this fractal whole on part on structure applies to probably all domains in culture. So I have 20 case studies in the book where I analyze different domains in culture using the three laws of whole on partons. So these are the main models of EvCult from the book all on one page. You have the fractal whole on part on model of bioculture applying to both biology and culture and bioculture as well. So you've got your fractal whole on part on structure and the three laws of whole on part ons. So those are the main tools for looking at the units and levels of culture and multi-level selection and as for the mechanisms of cultural evolution we have this fractal systems meta model of biocultural evolutionary creativity uh, which is a combination of Csikszentmihalyi's systems model of creativity and some of Dean Keith Simonton's work on evolutionary creativity, but it's fractal. So when you zoom in to each domain, it has the same mechanism inside. So that's basically the main models of EvCult in one slide. So EvCult is a set of tools or instruments for identifying and understanding units, levels, and mechanisms in cultural evolution. So this is photo 51, because I was thinking about how Watson, Crick, and Rosalind Franklin and everyone else discovered molecular structure of DNA. And I was thinking, that's a good question. What's the structure of culture? And so I think biology and culture 
a structured fractally. And so what's a fractal anyway? Well, here's some fractals in culture, some geometrical shapes. Fractals are self-similar on different size scales. See that tree branch down in the bottom right? And here's some fractals in nature, biology. Um, you know how a branch of a tree looks like the whole tree in miniature? And so I guess this is probably the most famous or popular fractal, the Mandelbrot set. See how there's smaller Mandelbrot sets within it? Anyway, better not watch that too long or we might get hypnotized. Anyway, so that's the kind of thing that's coming in the book in November 2021. And if you can't wait for the book, you could read those past five chapters, which are all basically the same thing. Uh, so what about memes? Well, I like the questions Richard Dawkins asked in The Selfish Gene. Um, <clears throat> but then, you know, sh surely there's got to be like in biology, some sort of units that are evolving ideas and theories and things. But I suggest we maybe skip over 40 years of meme theory, see my 2016 chapter, and then that's expanded out into the book. Then it's good to go back and reread meme theory to see what matches up. So I'm just going to talk briefly about four of the models in EvCult. The selection variation transmission evolutionary algorithm. And we've covered the three laws and multi-level selection. And I'll talk about I iterates to P, ideas iterate via processes to products. So the selection variation transmission algorithm where you can select two items from the pool, you can combine parts of them and transmit that new unit back into the pool. That's one kind of variation that can occur. And so another kind of variation is when there is a mutation in the pool and then that unit is selected and varied and transmitted back into the pool and at all times the pool has natural selection or natural preservation or natural retention operating on it at all times and here's a tree of culture or tree of knowledge model from the book mapping when each domain in science had its first international conference And here's a list of some domains. I think this model has implications or perhaps makes contributions to. So this is the I iterates to P model where a unit of culture can go from an idea through a process to a product. Or back the other way. So expanding Popper's three worlds concept to include not just mental processes, but also exterior world processes or algorithms. And in a case of convergence, this I iterates to P model has also been mathematized by Yingshu Wang. So what definitions am I using for evolution, culture, and creativity? 
I like all these definitions on the Appeal YouTube page. So there's the standard definition, variation, selection, replication. And within that, I look at evolutionary algorithms such as SVT. And of course, the whole time there's natural selection going on. But because there's two types of selection there, it's a little bit ambiguous. So Darwin wrote to Asa Gray saying he wished he'd called it natural preservation instead of natural selection. Um, and I think I prefer natural retention, but still the same Darwinian understanding of natural selection. Definition of culture. Well, this book has over 300 definitions of culture, but I like to reduce them to three things, ideas, processes, and products. So that's a compression ratio of about 100 to 1. Funny thing about culture, thoughts can become actions. Actions can change the world. So these things are ideas. These are processes. These are products. So one of the goals of EvCult is ethical culture where we consider all units and levels of the whole on parton at once. So on the right there, you can see I've assigned percentages for a given action because as David says in Atlas Hugged, what's good for me may not be good for my family. What's good for my family may not be good for my country. What's good for my country may not be good for my planet. So considering all these units and levels at once, or another name for this, curing cultural cancer. And as for creativity, there's the standard two-part definition, new and useful, or an artifact that's original and appropriate. But I prefer the standard tripartite definition that Dean uses, new, useful, and surprising. So a recap of definitions I use. Evolution as a process, for example, a unit that's undergone change via an evolutionary algorithm, and then you have selective sweep. So some of the algorithms are selection variation transmission or blind variation selective retention. And how to identify the discrete units, use those three laws of holon partons. Culture defined as ideas, processes, and products. Creativity, the three-part definition, new, useful, and surprising, which is the same evolutionary phenomenon in both biology and in culture. And the word mimetrix could also be used in EvCult because it combines the ideas from mimetics or the questions of mimetics with informatics and infometrics. So mimetrix and all derived from system science. So I made this program that shows how a system works. It's called the Systematizer. It's just an Excel program you can download and press the button and it, it learns new words. And if it knows the word already, it's happy. And if it doesn't know the word, then the algorithm becomes sad or the system. And so I also made this agent-based model of the global film industry as a system using NetLogo. And I made this artificial writer program, which is a top 20 return on investment movie idea generator. Uses combinatorial creativity. It combines two old movie ideas to get a new movie idea and then it judges them. So a generate and test algorithm and it judges them based on their evolutionary psychology content. 
Anyway, so I published on that in 2017. So there's a bit more about the book on my PhD blog. So I really enjoyed Ray and Dennis's talk from last month's appeal, talking about cells, tissues, organs, organisms. Enjoyed Mike's talk because of the secret chain and evolutionary ethics. And enjoyed Antonio's talk. I think we need a metacritic.com for science. Antonio mentioned there's all these criteria that we use to judge a science, but they're not always applied equally. I've also found these books very helpful. Dean's Creativity in Science, Lorenzo's Handbook of Model-Based Science, and David's This View of Life. Also found these books really helpful. Ed Gibney's Evolutionary Philosophy book and website. Andy Lord's Cleology website and Andy Norman's forthcoming Mental Immunity book, which is really useful for individual defense against cultural cancer. And these books are also very helpful. David put me onto most of these. And of course, Brian Boyd's On the Origin of Stories and Looking forward to Lorenzo's ethics book. Also want to thank Kurt and Peter at the Drachma Institute for some great questions and discussions. And of course, this view of life, um, it's like a free university for evolution. And David's pro-social world and watch out soon for the Ostrom Circle. Keep an eye on this view of life for that. Everybody here probably knows John Van Wy has a new book out, Darwin, A Companion. I wrote a play about Darwin's visit to Bathurst once. And I also want to recommend this great new resource, Talking Stories, Encyclopedia of Traditional Ecological Knowledge. And I didn't get to talk much about the structure of the Narim, the unit of story, but this is a fantastic website either way. Some questions for the audience. I'm collating a list of criteria for a science and also a list of flowcharts of the scientific method. So if you have any good ones, please send them to me. I'm also collating a list of predictions of evolutionary biology and for Ev cult. So if you know any good ones of Ev biology, please let me know. And do you know anyone who's invented a science lately? Um, please put me in touch so I can avoid some of the pitfalls because I think there's a lot of them. <laughs> and thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much. Questions? Um, João Pinheiro. Hi, thanks for the talk. So, um, I have a great deal of interest in cultural evolution, but I've always been very suspicious of mimetics, uh, particularly of the idea that we can uh, you know, isolate as cultural variants as discrete units. Uh, it does, I don't know, just to me, it doesn't really fit with sort of how I understand culture. And I wonder, for instance, uh, in your application of uh, these three laws of uh, all importance, as you call it, how does it actually work? Um, uh, cooperation and non-cooperation between, say, words, if they are to be considered indeed as units as such, or is exactly um, cooperation between words and and, or non-cooperation, perhaps, uh, more aptly, because I, I, I have difficulties understanding language as 
non-cooperative uh, to begin with. Uh, are there maybe cancerous words or, um, I don't know, just, uh, yeah. Thank you so much. That's a great question. Um, in short, one way to think of cooperation of words in these terms would be when you have a sentence, the words all operate together. So I'm using the word co-operate to form a larger group. And in terms of competing words, you know how there's a synonym for pretty much every word? When you compose a sentence or when I am putting together this sentence <laughs> or composing this sentence, I just did it there. I swapped in, in those two sentences, I swapped out the word composing for putting together. And so in the, in the mind of say a communicator or a writer, you always have to choose which word am I going to use next in this sentence. And so all the synonyms compete with each other in your mind as a writer. And on larger scales, each sentence competes as well in your mind when, when you write them on paper or say you're writing an academic article, you'll go through and do an edit and say, I could cut this sentence, I could cut that one, but that one has to stay. <laughs> um, so, and you may rephrase one particular sentence. So you're kind of, there's, there's several dimensions to this. One is when a letter, um, combines together to make a word. There are old sort of symbols and old letters you can use. And, you know, in Darwin's text, uh, some of the S's look like weird F's, like a, a musical notation note or something. It's a bit hard to read. <laughs> um, so there, there's always a competition going on when you're selecting which symbols. So selecting letters, selecting words, selecting sentences on larger scales. And so I'm thinking now of David in, in Atlas HUD, he's, he's obviously selected which points to make, uh, which, which ideas to include. I don't know how the editing process went, but whenever we edit our stories, um, there's a competition going on. And so that can be the micro um, is how I see it that's the micro in the mind of the writer. And, and that can involve an editor as well, of course. Um, and then once those units of culture, say a, a academic article or a new novel gets out into the wild among the larger macro system, now we have a competition for mind share, of course, where I have a hundred books sitting beside my bed right now. And I always have to, uh, struggle a little, a little and say, I really need to read that one because I'm probably going to have to cite it soon or, or whatever the case may be. So anyway, my, my 2016 chapter talks a bit about this, which, which is online. Happy to send it to anyone who wants to read it. But this is all expanded out pretty much in the book. Does that help with the, the idea of competition? It does help, um, but I'll have to think more about it. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. <laughs> David Sloan Wilson also has a question, and I think afterwards, Michael also. David, please. Your microphone. Oh, David, are you unmuted? Yep. Uh, begin by taking off on the previous uh, question. I think it's interesting to reflect upon what happened to the concept of selfish genes before we get to memes. And there, I think that it was um, justly criticized for being too atomistic. I mean, basically it's straight out of the modern synthesis and that uh, the kind of uh, opposition to it was like more systemic, like Susan Oyama, the idea of whole developmental systems, Evo Devo, which basically, uh, I mean, genes are part of a complex system that is evolving. So, I mean, th basically that's what happened to the concept of selfish genes and needs to happen for, for memes, uh, so, so that uh, what's evolving are whole cultural systems. And of course they include elements, those elements interact richly and, and so on and, and so forth. So I think that uh, when you look at where the field of cultural evolution has gone, um, it's gone very much in that direction. That's what cultural group selection is about. And 
and um, uh, uh, so on and so forth. We still use the word memes, and there is some sense in which we talk about single traits. But uh, so I think there's a lot of consilience, basically, that um, that we can draw upon. But actually, that wasn't my question. <laughs> do I still have time to ask that question? So, so uh, and it, it has to do with um, um, command and control. Your phrase, command and control. And I know from abundant experience that when you talk about the need to manage the process of cultural evolution, basically doing nothing is not an option. So therefore we have to do something. What words are we going to use? And when we use a word like manage, it triggers alarm bells in many people. And those alarm bells are about basically control or lack of control, basically done to as opposed to done with. And so as soon as it seems manipulative, so that some parts of the system are being manipulated by other parts of the system without their consent and control, then it becomes insidious and is insidious. I mean, so, so this is something that needs to be avoided in both word and action. But if that goes for the word management, it goes doubly for the words command and control. Or for most people, that means done too. And so, uh, and I think, well, what's really needed is something which is much more consultative, much more like subsidiarity. The lower level units actually have control. And it's only when a problem emerges up the line that something might be done. And even then it must be consultative and so on and, and so forth. So uh, I, I recommend that you choose words carefully. And, uh, and for that reason, don't use command and control. Actually, I, I suggest don't use them at all. Um, uh, or if you do, if you do, then be prepared to have to defend them and qualify them as I do with the word manage. And there's no word that fits. I mean, sometimes I use the word garden or tend or stewardship or something, but um, every word needs to be interrogated because, uh, because they're so contextual. No, brilliant point. Thank you, David. I, I'll go looking for our synonyms, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Michael, you also had a question, right? Michael Brady? No, no question? Okay, so then we go to Gerard. Uh, you had a question, right? You have to unmute yourself first. Mute. Yes. Yeah. Okay, this is better. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you, uh, Natalie, for inviting me on this uh, forum. Uh, I've not been here before, and it's very interesting. So that's really nice. Um, and then I want to thank uh, Veliskovsky for his very uh, interesting talk, very broad talk, uh, imaginative talk. Um, and then I, I would like to, to hook up to your last three questions, uh, which are the questions to the public. Um, I haven't written them down, but maybe you can show them or repeat them. Uh, th that I can answer maybe one by one or give suggestions for them. So what was the first of the three? Uh, from memory, compiling a list of criteria for science. Oh yeah. Um, that, <laughs> I, I may have a very sort of direct suggestion for that. Um, I wrote a book last year, a small booklet, which is called uh, Science Bites. And there is a chapter about the scientific criteria, uh, approximately 13, I gather it. Perfect. But that could help. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Yeah, it would be fun. I think uh, I, I, I'd love to get your opinion on it because you're, you're such a broad thinker. So maybe we can add more criteria. Uh, I've tried to do it quite rigorously, actually. Um, what, what, was your, what was your second point? I think it was predictions of evolutionary biology uh, and also flowcharts of the scientific method, because again, that's a problem of selection, variation and transmission. There are so many flowcharts of the scientific method. How yeah. do you pick just one? <laughs> yeah. um, I, I may not have an, an immediate short answer to that. So maybe then the third question. <laughs> uh, I think it was, sort of touching on maybe what you said before, if you know anyone who's created a science recently, I love to hear what the pitfalls are, you know. I mean, we could read Popper and Campbell and Kuhn and everyone talking about 
you know, where did phlogiston theory go wrong, etc. Um, I see mean theory as a bit like phlogiston theory until okay. there's a theory of oxygen from Lavoisier. It isn't quite nailed down mathematically, but yep, yep. anyone who's created some kind of mathematical science is, is always a helpful case study, I think. Uh, maybe I have a suggestion there, uh, because the, the hierarchy theory that you work with, uh, to me, appears to be a little bit sort of... Um, uh, brought together from uh, a lot of classical ideas um, and in a way I think uh, it, it, it could maybe be made a little bit sharper uh, because the, the, the criteria for the levels that you use, uh, I don't know wh whether you have them written down what criteria you use, but um, uh, I, I did a lot of work on this uh, to, to find uh, more uh, exact criteria for the levels. Uh, so if you want, if you want to elaborate on that, we could have a chat in maybe a separate uh, discussion uh, next week or something. Uh, I, I think I, I could offer you something there because I, I work from a, a theory that I developed, say, past twenty-five years, which which does a lot with levels. Wow! Great. So, size as possible. So. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's help. Okay. Great. Thank you very much, Gerard, and uh, thank you very much, AT, for your talk. We're going to uh, end the the official part. We're going to go to a more uh, uh, unofficial, informal uh, discussion. And so we're going to end the recording. I just want to say thank you very much to the three speakers and also to JT for organizing this webinar. And I want to say that the next webinar is going to be on the 23rd of April. We have Ian Tattersall, Robert Tassal, and uh, Francesco Ferretti together with uh, Ines Adornetti and Alessandra Scherscha. So it's also going to be a full program. Also, Europe is going to go into the light savings time. So um, uh, if you're from America or Australia, please keep that in mind as well. So thank you very much and bye bye. Um, so now I'm going to stop the recording. Stop recording. Do you want to stop recording?